no need, no, no need. This is going to be like really, really less interesting, but you know, we'll, we'll just try it anyway. Um, so everyone knows what a scheduler is in competing terms? You can say no, it's a safe space. We all know, cool. So uh, can you name one? Sorry? Bash. Bash. Okay. Nomad, that, I love that one. What else? We have the Linux scheduler, like it's on the kernel, what else? Huh? What else? There we go, finally. Uh, do you know how hard it is when you actually build a joke on a slide and someone has to actually say the word to trigger it? Anyway, um, so very interesting thing actually. Kubernetes is not a scheduler, but it has a pluggable scheduling system. Like, you can build your own scheduler and basically guide how Kubernetes is going to put things on machines. Um, Kubernetes has grown to be a considerable beast that provides an insane amount of functionality. So while we generally look at it as a container scheduler, uh, you know, it, it's way more than that. And, kind of, you know, schedulers is, is a topic that it's, it's kind of a pet peeve of me um, you know, and throughout history, and I'm going to guide you this because I, I'm a big history buff. If, if you go back to way back, you know, 1960s when computers, computer access was very limited, um, you quickly notice that basically the, the scheduler was people, okay? It was a sign-up sheet. People used to give you access to a computer um, that you used to um, consume. And processes, funny enough, were mostly like batch-driven. Okay, it wasn't long running services. You have a, com a particular computation to run, you put it on a punch card, um, you drop it somewhere, and at some point someone is going to put it on a loader and it's just going to run. Uh, I'm, I, don't look at, I don't look like this because I've been working in HashiCorp for three years, but I'm only 34, so I, I never saw this. Um, you know, and as, as we kind of advance on that, and I, that's a Wikipedia picture, and I love how happy that guy looks. Um, you know, basically, we, we went into the realm of time sharing, where you actually had real-time access to a computer, and, you know, there was some level of software generally embedded in kind of Multics or Unix that actually said, okay, the process you are running is going to run now, okay? You're going to get some level of interactivity to that. Um, you know, moving forward, 1980s, everyone got computers. We don't need scheduler's. You know, everyone just got a computer. So yeah, you know, schedulers are mostly people. You're deciding when to run things, or you know, you're still using big computers, using kind of Unix systems and so on. But ultimately, you know, you choose when to run um, whatever you want to run. Um, as we go into the 90s, this just scaled. Okay, now we have a kind of more client server architecture and your scheduler is still people or is still the operating system you are interacting with, okay? Um, the Windows scheduler wasn't particularly good back then. Everyone, someone remembers like putting a CD-ROM on a machine and waiting four seconds until whatever you were doing keeps doing. Um, that was because the scheduling was actually shared between the operating system and the actual hardware interrupts. So basically, when there was a hardware interrupt, Windows no, wasn't smart enough to actually manage it. So it just let the CPU froze it for five seconds until they could get compute access again. Um, you know, processes started to be more, you know, long-lived, okay? Um, we, we don't have to, you know, kind of monetize the time of compute we use, so we can just leave something running. And, you know, things are generally kind of process client side and, and stored server side. Uh, when we get to the you know, kind of the next decade, that's pretty much the standard. And it's somewhat the standard that we are still using, right? Um, the way we deployed applications in the noughties um, was that basically people just blessed uh, a bit of compute, a bit of tin with a particular software that is what go it was going to run. If we had to designate a scheduler, it's kind of pretty much the operating system or, um, you know, I. I Honestly, say it, it was Apache. It was Internet Information Services. You know, most of your uh, most of your applications were web scale, so basically your web server was designating what is it going to run and when. Um, processes are long lived. We mostly have a sort of terminal access to um, our system, and then um, 2010 came, and some people may argue have different opinions about this. 
but the scheduler was VMware, okay? You have all these team, you have your workloads packaged in sort of virtual machines. VMware is actually the thing that is granting resources to whatever. Um, that was the basically the parting. So we had, you know, kind of loosely, very loosely uh, scope workflows in the sense like, you know, I'm going to carve eight gigs of RAM. Um, if, you have, if you're running Java, it's eight gigs or nada. Um, but you know, about eight gigs of RAM, two CPUs, I'm going to throw it and VMware is going to find a place for it to run. It's going to do some overcommit, but you know, that is pretty much it. So we are about to jump decade. And what is it going to be the next thing? And that's what I've been thinking for the past, I know, um, two years. Is, is Kubernetes going to be the thing that is going to drive uh, compute moving forward? You know, uh, maybe long running services plus, you know, some event driven with something like Kubeless. Um, is it going to be AWS? Because AWS is doing a considerable amount of scheduling, right? They are effectively the new VMware. They are the control plane. They have the tin. They just decide where to run your workloads. And then they provide different levels of abstractions over that tin. But ultimately, what you're getting is pretty much the same. Is it, again, is it going to be event-driven? You know, they're offering functions of service. Uh, is it going to be the same with GCP? Is it going to be the same with Azure? Um, is it going to be Nomad? I like to believe so. Um, is it going to be people? Because right now, uh, you know, it's still mostly people choosing where to run things and choosing how to optimize resources. So uh, my, name, my full name is Nicolás Corrarello. Uh, I would urge everyone to call me Nico, especially if you're not Italian or Spanish. Um, my job in HashiCorp is to approve expense reports. Uh, that's literally all I do. I have a team of about 16 engineers. Um, you know, somehow they still allow me to write code, uh, particularly in uh, Vault. Uh, you all know what HashiCorp does? Yeah, I see a lot of notes. We have four software products. They do cool stuff, provisioning, cloud, security, um, connect, and a scheduler called Nomad. Um, I've been in HashCorp almost three years. I was employee number 70, I think. We're at like 700 um, right now. So it's been a long and crazy journey. Um, I'm based 30 minutes from here, 35 minutes from here. But um, most importantly, and I always make this distinction, um, no HashiCorp logo on the slide, no HashiCorp logo on my t-shirt. Uh, don't look at my laptop. <laughs> this is not HashiCorp's opinion, this is Nico's opinion. I don't see why HashiCorp disagrees with this opinion, but let's just say, you know, it's my opinion, find me in the usual methods. Um, so when we kind of talk about schedulers, um, there is no such thing as the zero cost scheduler. Okay, you have your workload, you ideally just want to focus on writing your workload, writing your business logic, and just run it with the minimum amount of overhead. Um, there is no concept as a zero, uh, you know, effort or zero complex, zero value scheduler. The closest you can get to is something that is very low and very predictable, right? when um, organizations are looking, to, looking at a way to actually schedule workloads and run applications, they probably want to be at you know, a minimal and predictable layer of complexity that they need to add on top of whatever brings value um, to their business. Then you have like, you know, the low complexity schedulers, the ones that, you know, people is a great example of this, okay? The complexity of how you put applications and get applications to run and run over time um, increases linearly with the amount of applications you run. And I don't think anyone can argue this, right? If you are a system administrator or an SRE or whatever it's called now, and you know, you're running 150 applications, it's go, you know, running 300 is going to be twice as hard as running those 150. So you generally look for something, again, either in the ideal or something like a high complexity scheduler. Okay, where effectively you are going to pay an incremental cost in terms of the amount, you know, as you adopt a large number of applications. But get, guess what? That cost is going to come down because you are architecting a platform that, you know, while it looks very expensive in a particular range of applications, and I just made those numbers up to prove a point, 
But um, as you scale to a particular aspect, you're going to hit the peak complexity per application, and then the number is going to go down, okay? Because you are already setting up for scale. Which comes to a point that uh, seems to, if you will, elude a number of people and was made in London DevOps last year, which is well-architected monoliths are actually okay. It's not bad, okay? If you're running five applications and you're going to go ahead and go through the pain of deploying something like Kubernetes to run five applications, you're going to invest more, more time running Kubernetes than actually maintaining your application. It's controversial, but it is the way it is, okay? And ultimately, if you still want to use Kubernetes, you have options. You can go and hire it as a service, okay? You can go to Google or you know, Amazon or whatever, just use it as a service. That's fine, but you know, always consider what is going to be the scale of your application. And you know, basically, when you're designing something from scratch, you actually may start from this. It may be the easier way to get something up and running, okay? Distributed systems architecture is really, really not for everyone. And that is, somewhat particularly relevant when like, you look at the kind of organizations uh, we work with, okay? Or I work with on my day-to-day. -day. Um, by the way, massive shout out to Sapien. They do an amazing job with one of our customers, with one of our products. So massive shout out. Um, it's seriously really good stuff. Um, so when I go to, let's just call it Bank A, and it's not that bank I'm talking about. Don't, don't worry, Mark. it's not that bank. You know, they have their traditional ops world, okay? This traditional ops world is, is, is VMware, okay? It's the same stuff they've been using. Hopefully, they run it themselves. Mostly, they outsource it, okay? So they have interactions through uh, tickets that get to somewhere, and it's very slow. So that doesn't work, right? That is what we came here to throw away. Um, but that is, going to be con that, that is going to continue to linger there for maybe 10 or 15 years. So then you have the really innovative guys. Like, you know, the, there is a particular digital team that goes, um, okay, yeah, you know, we, what they have, don't worry, we're, we're just going, you know, full on, 100%, we're going to the cloud, okay? Um, but as you have those guys, you're going to have three or four teams of people that are going to go like, oh, no, that doesn't scale. We're going to go OpenShift, we're going to go GKE, we're going to go, I think that's the logo for App Engine in Azure. And um, you know, everyone is taking a completely different route in terms of what they're going to do. Um, remember that scale graph? That's my photo, I don't want my photo. Remember that scale graph I was talking about? So the only thing they're doing is basically moving these goalposts. They're just moving these goalposts forward. Um, The fun part is, you know, they, they all do it for the same thing. You know, it's, they all do it to get digital transformation. Um, let me tell you a little bit about digital transformation. Um, who heard someone try to sell you the Netflix case as digital transformation, right? Netflix killed Blockbuster, right? Do you remember who Blockbuster killed? Because Blockbuster killed someone. I had like a neighborhood video rental store and they killed someone. My neighborhood video rental store was actually keeping uh, you know, video rental records on index cards. And yeah, and Blockbuster had actual computers. They actually did the first digital transformation, which was the systems of record, right? When you look at computer, and this is a very old topic, and if you want to read about it, there is an excellent article in um, Forbes from 2012 um, kind of dividing systems of record from systems of engagement. So Blockbuster did the digital transformation very, very right, okay? They, and, and no one is discussing this. I mean, I think we're, we all agree. Systems of records are digital. They are not paper anymore. They are not manual. Um, if you Google this, actually, the, uh, there is a, a, like, a, uh, like, a, the, like the Gov UK page, but for the Australian government, has, honest to God, um, like a list of pros and cons of actually doing your accounting in paper and doing it on a system. Um, if, if you actually want to laugh at it, just look at that. Um, but anyway, I, I don't think anyone is arguing, you know, systems of record, that was the first digital transformation. That's fine. Um, 
but we're not focusing on that anymore. Why do you think that is? And I'm going to tell you anyway. Um, the reason we're not focusing on this is because whoever you are and in whatever vertical, you're going to use maybe one of, let's say, 15 systems of record. You're going to do an RDBMS. You're going to use a, a file system. You're going to use an object store. You're going to use uh, MongoDB, whatever. You're going to use one of 15 or 20 you know, um, systems of record, unless you're Bloomberg. They actually read the, re written their own systems of record, but you know, that, that's a story for another day. Um, so you're not going to get any advantage with your systems of record. Like, let, let's be clear, you, you're going to make operations a couple of seconds faster. Guess what? Your competition can do exactly the same because we are all using the same systems. We don't care about systems of record. So what do we care about in application? We care, of, we care about the systems of engagement, okay? That is what's going to give me the difference. I always say the same thing. Um, I, I chose my insurance company because I like the way um, you know, I can interact with them through their website. Um, they are a HashiCorp customer, but that's not, <laughs> that, that's not a point. Um, you know, I, I like the way I interact with them through their website. This is where we can you know, innovate faster, right? OK, so let's talk about how we transform applications so they run in the new world. This is generally where most companies get. They're going to grab the UI, they're going to put it somewhere else. Someone else is going to develop it. It's going to look nice. And I'm going to take my business logic and do it as an API, okay? So I package this on Docker, I create a, a, a Helm chart, and I deploy it. Job done. That's it. What we're doing is, with that is basically the same thing we did for WebScale. Okay, we built one application, we grabbed WordPress, we grabbed, you know, whatever, we wrote on PHP or whatever language, I'm not bashing at any language, um, but basically we said like, we have our systems of record, that's my SQL, that's Postgres, that's whatever. I have PHP here, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to scale it to five instances. If I need more, I'm going to scale it to six. Um, if that's what we're using a container scheduler for, you know, you're definitely not seeing the value out of doing that, okay? There is the green field, and that's fine. You're going to write smaller applications and interact with each other, but you know, you have all this thing that you actually wanted to transform. So if the limit of your transformation is kind of breaking presentation from business logic, don't waste a second on using a container scheduler. Just put in an auto scaling group or whatever Google calls it. That's it, I don't care. So let's take the UI out, okay? So hopefully you start breaking up this big monolith into its minimal um, components, right? So you're going to have your basic logic API. That probably you can decouple. And if you're doing a microservice, this, this probably won't be decoupled anymore. If you need to decouple it, that's, that's your application, right? Then you're going to have, I know, reporting, okay? Some output some process that actually goes and collects data and it takes long to run. Um, and it's the thing that generally if you are using PHP, you run out of memory during execution or you got to an HTTP timeout because it took too long to collect rows and do something, okay? That, we probably need to decouple it. Um, different processes, when you add a record, for example, okay? If you're adding a record, you're doing a number of kind of validations and, and, and checks and so on, um, you may want to decouple that from your logic. Um, and then, you know, uh, I take this example because I do this a lot, um, which is the crypto example. Um, I encrypt, when, generally when I'm writing an application, I encrypt data in transit. Um, so basically, I go to an external service, I send unencrypted data, I get encrypted data returned to me, I persist it, okay? So if someone goes and steals my database or whatever, the data they get, they cannot exfil it, okay? It's encrypted. I hold the keys to decrypt it, and only the applications got the keys. Um, but it's not good, I mean, it's great that I encrypt it once, it's even better if I rewrap it every six months or so, okay? So that's a periodical process that I um, just need to run. So, you know, when, when we started kind of 
decomposing this application, we actually start noticing something. Um, that this application has certain parts that are long-lived, right? They're going to stay in execution for a while, okay? And then you have certain things that just run once or run with a particular set of parameters and obtain a result. But its lifetime is short or limited to something. And then you have things that run periodically, okay? So let's go back to the way you traditionally package your application in a container, which is all of this is part of a single container, a single code base, a single long leap process, right? How much resources do you think your container can consume? What is your container view of the world? Okay, I'm, I'm a process, I'm running in a system. What is my constraint in terms of resources? Whatever C groups give, groups give me, whatever I have available, okay? But then again, I was running this thing called a container scheduler. So that has actually a wider view of the world. So how about this? You know, I have my UI, my API. This is long running services, okay? I have my control plane here. This gives me compute. This gives me, um, you know, storage. This gives me whatever. So guess what? If someone needs to add a record, you know, I'm not telling my kernel, if you will, go spawn off a thread and then just process this, okay? Because I'm just ring fenced by a machine. I can go to my bigger control plane, which is there, which has a very, very wide view of the world and say, just run this, whatever, okay? And then I have my different kind of processes, right? I have my batch, uh, I have my periodic processes, and, and so on. So um, a quick example of this, um, and the reason I put this here is because um, I'm honestly running this on our suite of tools, right, and it's running at home. And basically, I have the process of adding a book to my library. You can actually hit that address and it will open. Um, when I add a book, I actually need to go to an API, scrape details about a book, get all those details, encrypt them, something. It's a long process. Why would I put it in my interactive thread? So what I actually do is when I add a book in this application, I go to a scheduler, happens to be Nomad, kill me, I work for HashCorp, um, and I just tell it, you know what, start another process with these parameters. I don't care when it runs. The UI is just going to check against another record, uh, another tool, whenever that book showed up, right? But in the meanwhile, I know, I'm looking. Um, in the meanwhile, I, that process runs somewhere else. It wasn't constrained by my own constraints. It, it was just constrained by the cluster, okay? And that is a very good example of processes you can start breaking up in, for example, batch, or you know, when you do crypto and I re-encrypt everything. Now, it will come a point where even your processes are too big. And then we start looking at something that, you know, um, I'm going to say British people, even though I'm British, but I've only been British for six months, um, are really, really good at that, which is um, actually queuing. Okay? Um, I, I work with highly complex financial organizations where this is, is pretty much their bread and butter. But if you're going to do this for like a small project that runs in five, you know, runs in five steps, you probably can just run it, you know, um, program, you, know you, you can just run it one after the other instead of actually decoupling that process. So we go back to this, and you know, what, what we're focusing is on, on, this, on this particular side of the house. Um, you know, I, I actually got this um, diagram for, uh, you know, I think it's RabbitMQ, um, but effectively what you're going to do is just queue the operation, right, and at some point, Different processes that do a little bit of the process is going to take, do its bit, requeue it in an R queue. An R one is going to take it, do its bit, put it in an R queue. Okay? And that's how you ultimately scale those batch processes. Now, those actual consumers, uh, guess where they will run? They will run on scheduler of some sorts. Okay? So, um, a couple of conclusions. Um, Transform your applications, not your CV. Uh, this one is very controversial, but um, ultimately, uh, 
this has been a joke that has been running on LinkedIn for the past six months. I've seen people like, you know, the only thing that Kubernetes will improve is your CV. I don't think that's the case. But I do think, definitely, um, that you actually need to look to what gives you the most. Always consider the scale and complexity of, of your application. Um, if you invest in a scheduler, get the most out of your, out of your scheduler. Um, I work with um, large financial organizations that go like, look, yeah, we have this Kubernetes pattern that we're going to deploy. And I go like, okay, that's cool. So you're going to make it available for everyone. No, everyone is going to deploy their own Kubernetes cluster. So why, oh, why are you using Kubernetes? Okay, period. Schedulers and queues are expensive. And believe me, if you're consuming it in a simple way, you're going to be definitely be paying for it in, in some other way. Okay, there is, there is always trade for that. So that said, uh, thank you very much if you're still listening. And I don't know if I had five minutes, but I may have two for questions. Sorry? Why have we not seen such a big jump in terms of technology and the way you operate in the last 10 years? Um, have we seen for the last 30, 60 years? Partly, uh, my, my personal view, partly it's affected by more law. I mean, we are getting to the ultimate scale in terms of uh, more law, which means that you know everything that we were centralizing, because now we have way more and more and more compute, guess what? We have to break out again because now we have a lot of very powerful small things rather than what we used to see the world, which is like, you know, a very powerful big thing. Um, I honestly think that said, I don't necessarily agree with the, you know, the fact that how we, how we you know, have grown or, or in terms of technological advantage, uh, advantages, um, you know, I'm, I'm seeing a, a, like, I don't think it has maybe caught up or is starting to catch up in the, main, in, the, in the mainstream, but if I just give you an example, like, you know, the event-driven approach is not new. Five years before Lambda existed, Boeing was running something in their Dreamliner called the Trapper Keeper, um, which actually Puppet made, um, which is made for event-driven um, compute. That's the plane that hasn't crashed for those that hear Boeing and are scared. Um, but yeah, you know, I think it, th there are certain things where we, just innovation takes time to get to the mainstream market or you know, to whatever, the traditional industries that are the early adopters. Okay. I think that's it. All good, thank you. Thank you